Have you ever seen cool pictures of proteins? Things like this with those cool like ribbons and sheets and cool colors and stuff and wonder how the heck um, those were determined and how to interpret them. Is that you get take this crystal and you stick it in front of an x-ray beam. And so x-ray is, an x-ray is just really highly energetic light. So it's just like visible light, but it's more energetic. And what happens is when these x-ray beams hit the crystals, they're actually going to interact with the electrons. The electrons are going to scatter these x-rays. And so you have this beam of x-rays that's coming in one way and then they're all getting scattered. And when waves, um, when the waves get scattered, what happens is that they kind of like run into one another and you get something called, um, constructive and destructive interference. So constructive interference is where the waves add together and destructive interference is where they cancel out. And so what happens in this, in a crystal is that the signal, because of this repeating pattern, what happens is that they cancel out almost everywhere except for specific points and those points where you get the constructive interference so the waves adding together those um bigger waves are going to go and they're going to hit a detector and you get this series of spots called the diffraction pattern then what happened what you do is you actually work backwards from that series of spots from that diffraction pattern to get the electron density map so that weird blobby meshy thing we were talking about before and that's going to show you the position of the electrons and then you build the atomic model into that map so that's where you put though you say okay we know that the electrons are in this area and that the um, that the center of the atoms is going to be in the center of that and then you can build the atomic model into the map. How well you can do this is going to depend on things like your um, the resolution of your data. So the resolution is like how well you can tell apart two different things. So with um, crystallography if you have higher resolution um, your it's easier for you to see where to put the atoms into the map um, and so the resolution that you collect is going to depend on mostly on like the quality of the crystal at the density we'll just look at this um, part and view we'll do view the around the whole structure and update okay so now what you see is you can see the structure that they built the model that they built into this map so if we turn we can turn off this cartoon view and we'll turn off these and now you can see so this is the sort of thing that you get this the electron map um, the electron density map so this is working backwards from those diffraction spots you get this meshy mappy thing and so if we look at this now knowing what the structure is you can see here you can see like the dna um and that sort of thing and then with the help of the software and knowing what the sequence is then you can build in the model it. um and you can see that it fits nicely in here the data that you're getting from the diffraction pattern is what you're using to build this electron density map and then you're building the model into the map because you're building the model into the map the there's going to be, you need to make sure that the model actually fits in the map that you're building. And there's different values that we can use to assess how well the model fits the data. Um, and then also there are things that we can use to talk about how good that data is. And there are also things that we can talk about, um, about how realistic the model is um, from like a structural and biochemical standpoint. And so the PDB helps us understand these. Um, and so here they're showing it in these PDB validation sliders. Um, and you can also get a lot more information if you look at the full report, but we're not going to go into that right now. Um, but so one value that we talked about is the resolution. So that's basically how that's talking about that meshy thing and how basically how tight the meshy thing is around where the atoms actually are. And so if you have a big sausagey thing that's poor resolution, it's hard to place those atoms and it's hard to tell apart what's what. 
But if you have a high resolution, then you can really um, start to see things like the side chain, so the part of the amino acids that stick off. Um, and you can start to get like orientations and stuff. And so often the back, sometimes the backbone is all that you're able to see and all that, so sometimes we'll just model in the backbone. Um, and it's harder to see the side chains which tend to be more flexible, um, have weaker density, um, flop around more and stuff. And so are harder to model in unless you have higher resolution. So here we have a resolution of 2.5 angstrom and angstrom is this unit for really small things. Um, we also have this value, R va these R values. Um, so these refer to how well the, um, the so the R free value is basically how well the data fits to your model. The R value with the work um, is kind of more, the R work value is a little more complicated. Basically, when you're working with making the model you want to make sure that you're not overfitting your model so basically it's kind of like that idea where if you have a curve you don't want to like if you were to use a quadratic formula or whatever if you keep adding exponents you can get the curve to fit your data a lot better but it's not really generalizable because you're like fitting into the noise um and so we want to make sure that we're not fitting our model into the noise and so what you do is you actually hold out some of the data and you only build your model with part of the data set um and then you test with the rest of the data set whether the model still works with that data and so the our work value is kind of like um the stuff that you're working with and so you can lower this value and so get a better fit of the model to the data but the r when you then go and apply that model or that model to the data that you haven't worked with yet so the data that you held out um that'll be the r free and so you can see that the r free is higher um which tells you that you're overfitting your model a bit. Um, but your R free value is always going to be higher than the R work, um, but you want to make sure they're not too far apart. Um, so you can see here the R free is the top um, slider on these charts. Um, so with these charts, they're showing you, so in the black line is the percentile relative to all x ray structures. Um, and then in the um, unshaded box you have the percentile relative to x-ray structures of similar resolution um, and then this is showing you where this model fits compared to those others so we talked about the R free and so that's a measure of how well your model fits the to the data the clash score has to do with whether the atoms where you're posted so now with the clash score with the rest of this stuff we're getting into the quality, so with the resolution, we got into the quality of the diffraction data. Um, so the resolution is defined when you collect that evidence and you can't change, um, you can't like improve that afterwards or anything. Um, but the then the R values are going to come for when you're doing the modeling phase um, and they reflect how well the model fits the data. And then, even so you could have a model that really well fits the data, but if it doesn't, make sense there's probably something wrong with it and so when it comes to the making sense part we're talking about like whether the atoms can actually um like physically be where you think that the, where you say your model says that they should be um so one of the big things is steric clashing um so basically that's the idea that two molecules can't be in the same place at the same time um so you can't have um and that the molecules need their personal space. So basically, you have this class score where if the molecules, like if their electron clouds are too close or whatever, that it wouldn't be physically possible, um, then that'll be a ding on your class score. Um, then we have outliers. So the class score is kind of just based on where the atoms that you put in there are and how close they are to one another. But then the outliers are based on what is known about what positions like the atoms and like to take. Um, and so this is often talking, so we can think about 
in terms of the protein backbone, which is represented with this Ramachandran outliers, and then the side chain outliers, um, and then the RSRZ outliers, which is kind of like whether things are sticking out of the map that you built in. So that's a little different. But with the Ramachandran outliers and the side chain outliers, you're looking at like the geometry of the bonds and the positions of the side chains. So basically a Ramachandran plot is looking at these like dihydral angles. So when we talked about peptides, uh, amino acids being joined by these peptide bonds, um, and I said those they were like special, they, they had the restricted motion. Um, so there are only a couple places that they can rotate. Um, and those couple places give you the psi and the phi angles. And there are specific places that specific, um, those angles are constricted, restricted to specific like angle ranges. And so when you have an outlier, that'll ding up on the um, Ramachandran plot score.